quicken the spirit. If you have ever wondered how the team behind Queen Mary's Dark Harbor turns terrifying legends and monsters into reality, you are about to find out. Epic Entertainment and My Co2 Inc. have mastered the art of scare through the creation of intense, immersive experiences. Singular scare zones, terrifying mazes, iconic characters, and most importantly, well-stocked bars. <laughs> Welcome to turning nightmares into reality with the brilliant minds behind Queen Mary's Dark Heart. <laughs> Hello, children! Welcome! Greetings to my freaky family! What a year and a half of complete madness and mayhem! Yes! <laughs> Speaking of insanity, I am thrilled to be here with you this evening. I am vaxxed and masked, I have my flask, and I'm ready to entertain. <laughs> This is Midsummer Scream? <laughs> Awaken the spirits? Oh, is that a new bar? <laughs> you don't need the ringmaster! What? <laughs> well then, I'll be at the bar. For six years, I had the immense pleasure of portraying the ringmaster at Queen Mary's Dark Harbor. Do I have any Dark Harbor freaky family cast members here today? Well, welcome again, and thank you for being here in person, and thank you for attending our panel. Today, we are going to draw back the curtain or in this case, we're going to take a deep dive into the bowels of the majestic queen and gain a little insight on how the creative minds were able to turn historic legends into reality and create such memorable monsters and bring them to life. So, I think we'll start. This is your captain speaking. Uh, captain, what are you doing here? Andrew, you look terrible. It's Peggy. I mean, Peggy, you look marvelous. Sorry, I didn't recognize you without the apple box. Well, you should talk, you're in cartoon form. Well, we didn't have the budget to fly Renee out to do my makeup, so this is all you get. Uh -huh. 2D and one shade of green. Uh, Captain, what, what are you doing here? Well, I heard you say historic legends and memorable monsters, so I assumed you were introducing me. No, not everything's about you. It's not? Mm. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I'm having trouble grasping exactly what it means. Okay, then I'll be a little more straightforward, Captain. I'm sorry, but we don't need your help. Oh. Well, couldn't I just stay and watch? You won't even know I'm here. I just drape across the top of Wally's head like a Captain Comover. <laughs> I'm telling Wally you said that. He already knows he's bald. Yeah, that's right. right, all right, I'm going. I'll just go and join the ringmaster at the bar. Oh, well, you might need Steve a token. You know what? I'll just go and drink in my trailer. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, our beloved captain. Yeah. 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 Always trying to upstage me, that one. Well, let's take a little trip down memory lane. Here's a little reminder of what we were up to when you last saw us. Darling, it's the ringmaster here. <laughs> so good to see you. It is my distinct privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to the anniversary season of the Queen Mary's Dark Heart. Oh, joy.
What's that? I want one. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a trio of very talented, twisted, but always inspirational creative individuals who for over a decade have brought you the one and only Queen Mary Stark Harbor. Please join me in welcoming to the stage my friends, co-founders and producers of Epic Entertainment, Charity Hill and Steve Sheldon, and our fearless talent director, co-founder and chief creative officer of MyCo2, David Wally. Let's just start right into some of our conversation. I think we're going to have a. Oh, I think we're going to have a really fun time. Excuse me, I don't have my my people here. <laughs> Carry my props. <laughs> okay. Well, before we dive into the creative process of Dark Harbor, um, why don't you, uh, the three of you share a little bit about the origins of Dark Harbor and your individual paths to and through the event? Uh, yeah, I think I'm the old man here, so I'll go first. Uh, I started with Dark Harbor back in 2010 um, when we followed a, an event that used to be run at the Queen Mary called Shipwreck that had run for many years. Um, some of you might have even worked it. Um, and the year that I came in was 2010 when Dark Harbor was brought on board and branding a, uh, a brand new event and creating new characters, new mazes, new monsters, and trying to bring some life back into um, the event. I had never done a Halloween before. I didn't go to Halloweens. I didn't like horror films. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. But my friends who brought me in assured me that I would um, enjoy it. And in fact, I had the most fun I'd ever had in my life working um, that first year and really um, uh, finding and helping to create a wonderful family atmosphere that has only grown over the years and uh, I really miss my family these last couple of years so I can't wait for us to be able to get back to it. Amen to that. Uh, I think I came next. I, would, I came along in 2011 uh, as the Director of Entertainment and Events at the Queen Mary and Dark Harbor was of course uh, our largest uh, and dare I say best of it. And uh, so I got to, to jump into what was uh, my first venture into to Halloween and, and the haunt industry. Um, and it was uh, daunting and terrifying for many reasons, but um, also uh, one of the most gratifying experiences I've ever had because I was uh, immediately welcomed into the Dark Harbor family. And it was very much a time of transition and, and still, you know, figuring out the rebranding and how that would work and new characters, new mazes and all of that. But uh, the constant, I think, is the, the family that is uh, everyone behind Dark Harbor. And, and uh, that is something that I miss as well. And for me, I came into Dark Harbor in 2012, mid-season. And I just remember being blown away. Um, I came on to work as the assistant director of entertainment events at the Queen Mary. Um, with Steve and to come into that production while it's operating and know that I would at some point sit at the helm of it was so overwhelming. I just remember feeling like it already operated like a machine. You know, it's like this fever pitch and it's all the cast and the crew that make it what it is today, yesterday, tomorrow and I just remember feeling grateful and proud and excited to be a part of it and I still had no idea exactly what that was going to be or what it was going to look like at the time but I definitely knew I wanted I really wanted to put my stake in it. So let's talk about the collaboration between you three. I mean that's a big part of any artistic endeavor. So how did you three come together and, and find common ground and share ideas? Tell us a little bit about your process as a trio. I think, um, you know, we, 
make it a make it a fantastic team which is we have a lot of fun together which is what i think uh, is at the core of what makes everything work it's our carver um you know with epic uh, charity and i um kind of were with epic we sit at the as the kind of umbrella that uh, that touches every aspect of the event um from you know the not so fun stuff which is you know permitting and city guidelines and health department and all of that nitty gritty stuff that we spend all year planning to the more fun stuff, which is the creative and the, the actual event operation. Um, so we, we get to kind of have our hands in, in every little piece of it. And I think when it comes to what we find to be the most fun is the, the creative and the, the actual activation of it. Um, you know, we have a, a great team that's very collaborative that um, we, we just do what we think is fun. We have a lot of fun together. That's really the goal. When do you guys start the process in the year? We're typically planning next year while the current year is in operation. So we, we have meetings during um, actual dark harbor nights. Sometimes we'll pull each other aside and have a quick 30 minute meeting to say, hey, look at this over here. You know, this is working great. This is something we should continue next year. Or hey, over here, this isn't working so great. Let's, let's change it. Let's think about next year doing something a little bit different. And Charity, how about you? How, how do you find collaborating with these two handsome fellows? Easy. Um, you know, I think what I love about working at Dark Harbor is, I know a lot of people say it, but it feels like a family. And for us, our creative process might start with Steve and I, very quickly adding David, um, but we like to um, involve every single facet of, of the project, so we might pull in talent for brainstorms, we'll pull in costume, makeup, all the way to operations people and security just to get different perspectives. And I think the idea of collaboration is, is something that we do really well. We, we listen, or at least try to listen, um, as much as we can to the feedback we get to the, from the audience as well as, as the people who are working with us from cast and crew, and um, I think the collaboration part is probably the most fun. It, it is, and as you alluded to, you know, it's not just the three of us, it's, it's uh, Adam and Steven and their team who've been with us forever, and Katie and Jeff and their departments who've been with us forever, the operations guys who've been there forever, and we have developed a shorthand and a trust with each other that allows us to be able to really, you know, go to the wall, you know, and push each other to, to the best. I, as Steve was alluding to earlier, I sometimes write voluminous emails of the things that I really would like to see happen, <laughs> you know, and it, it's great that, uh, that we're able to do that with each other and really sort of say, how are we going to keep making it better each year and not rest on our laurels, but try to do the best we can for our company of people and our audience. And I think that's what we do together. We sit down every year and say, can we make it better the next than the previous year? And if not, then we need to take a good hard look at what we're doing. So we kind of enter into our own kind of personal verbal contracts that we're not in this unless we're going to make it better than the year prior. And I think that's really important when it comes to the body of work and um, the story and you know, the whole event experience um, holistically. And, and I think that's what we just set out and strive to do while having, you know, a kick-ass time doing it. <laughs> well, it's definitely gained momentum over the years. Don't you think they've talked themselves year after year? Everybody. You know, with Hans, it's not a linear story like a film or a movie. Um, so sometimes stories sort of lost because there's so much more visual stuff happening and just the interaction with guests. How, what does story even mean in, in the Haunt world and especially in Dark Harbor because the stories are, are pretty rich there? Who well, wants to feel that? The one? first couple of years, you know, um, the event was brand new and it was come in, the, the guys who mounted the first year, one of whom I don't know if many of you knew him, um, Robert Koval was the producer the first year. He was a great and wonderful man and um, he passed away suddenly um, a few weeks ago. Um, it was a tremendous loss. I, I loved working with him very much. Um, but he and another friend of mine, Tom Clough, had originally planned to be doing the event at the Orange County Fairgrounds and they you know, didn't end up getting their deal made with them. 
Um, so they came over to the, the Queen Mary and said, we've got this idea, can we do it here? And the ownerships said yes. And so it was an idea that was created sort of from outside, you know, the notion of it being a Queen Mary event. And for those of you who remember those early years, you know, we had different face characters. We had Mundara in, in season one, and I've got some photos coming up later. And then her sisters joined the crowd in season two. And the team sort of got together after that second season and really decided what we needed to do to make this event really special at the Queen Mary was to take advantage of that incredible ship and its history. And so in 2012, we branded our first five characters, the, the Captain, Graceful Gale, Scary Mary, Half-Hatch Henry, and Samuel the Savage. And once we did that, I think we really felt like, oh, this is the right track. This is what Dark Harbor needs to be. And I think what we were surprised to find was it wasn't just that somebody thought of these characters and said, let's do it and did a sketch. But then costumes had to invent who those characters were and the makeup department had to determine what those characters looked like. And most importantly, we had to find the right human beings to inhabit them and bring them to life. And um, some of them, I think, clicked in instantaneously and a couple of characters took, you know, a year or two to find the real juice behind that character. And then in 2013, that's where I think the event really took off because we decided we needed, we needed to not just like have rock bands on the stages. We wanted to do more entertainment. We wanted to have more fun. We needed a party. And the only way to do that was for the captain to summon, you know, the, the king, queen, he, she, they of all parties, the ringmaster, to, to bring her circus to life. And I think, you know, I think it was 12 that we brought in Dead Rise, and that sort of had a strong connection to the ship. And at 13, the circus came in. And I think those two dynamics of, of off the ship of Dead Rise and the circus, and then starting our entertainment program, really brought the exterior of the ship to life and we're able to take advantage of those great mazes that we've got on the ship as well to round ourselves out. So let's continue a little bit more about talking about that. When you were creating those new mazes, um, where did you find the inspiration? Where did you draw the inspiration from? Well, as David said, you know, we really like to use historic assets and the history of the ship. And I feel like we find our little bit of magic in that gray area where we blur the lines from history and historic to a little bit of fantasy and I think in there is a sweet spot for us so um, organically it's it's doing a lot of research um, Steve and I will find ourselves in Scotland for instance a couple years ago because that was where the ship was built and um, kind of tracing back its history and that was when we burst the maze intrepid um, so I think it's about travel, um, trying to take things from reality, and really focusing on historic aspects. Uh, I think people gravitate toward that. They like a little bit of reality with their hysteria. I think too, you know, something we realized, you know, about that time, 2012-ish, is you know something that sets the Queen Mary in particular aside from anyone else is her history. She is a living, breathing entity. Um, and her stories are living and breathing. There's so much content there, we've barely scratched the surface, uh, even now, this many years later. And so to, to not take advantage of that, that story almost felt um, like a betrayal to, you know, to the queen, um, because there's, there's so much there, and it's so great to be able to, to bring some of those stories to life. Tell us a little bit about um, your storyboard process. Once you landed on like the Iron Master or um, the Ring Master or any of the masters, um, what was your what was your process there? Did you start with images or? Why don't we throw the keynote up and we can sort of talk through it and talk through some of the images in it as we go? Great. Pull out my little remote control to blow all of us up. So this is going back um, for those of you who might remember um, from left to right. That was Boondara the wonderful horn character that was played most nights by Jennifer Hills, um, wonderfully. And then in season two, we had her two sisters, um, Matanut, who 
was all about the sea, and Seer, who was all about fire. And those two characters back then um, related to, what do we call it in the first couple of years, Submerged and Hellfire. And in addition to those main characters, you know, the Sliders had a, diff a definite look way back then, very much sort of Son of Anarchy type of uh, aesthetic. And we had these wonderful actors who inhabited our street characters and our maze monsters, and we had a makeup department that was just out of this world. And then this is what I was talking about in 2012. These were the first five characters, and it, it started with this um, sketch that J.J. Wickham, J.J. James now, um, our production designer came up with, and that led us to figuring out who we wanted to play those characters. Boondara, Jennifer Hills, we immediately cast as Graceful Gale, and little known fact, Peggy, um, those characters started in the maze the first year, and Peggy was the other Graceful Gale um, back in 2012. And Brad there is the captain. She was a silent character. Yeah. <laughs> Which I liked. Exactly. That changed the next year. <laughs> and then that was the next year when we brought um, the ringmaster in and, and really started to. I've always loved this photograph. It was one of the great ones we did down in the weather room. And so this is sort of where we, we had those first characters. So if you want to sort of talk about them and where we came up with them a little bit. Yeah, what was, I mean, where did you draw your inspiration for these backstories, for some of these people who weren't historical? And then conversely, the historical ones, what sort of, um, you know, exceptions did you make or how did you approach their character story? I think um, these initial characters, aside from the ringmaster, um, these initial characters all came from coming through the archives of the ship, um, you know, six floors below deck at the Queen Mary, there's a, uh, an archive section that few people are uh, fortunate enough to ever go to, um, but it holds just a, a wealth of information and backstory and information about the ship that includes um, uh, reported sightings. And so we went through um, kind of the, the most reported paranormal sightings aboard the ship and what they all pointed back to. And we came up with characters inspired by those sightings that were reported the most. Um, the Lady in White was the one lady of the White most, is, right? Yeah, is one of the, she is uh, the inspiration for Graceful Gale. Um, you know, Half Hatch Henry is inspired by John Pedler, who was, uh, who really was cut in half by Door 13. Um, so yeah, we, we went back to those real stories and, and these characters are inspired by them. And then I remember in um, B340, people wouldn't even, maids wouldn't go in there, people wouldn't want to, have, they wanted to try to make office spaces there at one time and everyone refused and so it just sits there cold and empty. Now it's been renovated, the, the B340 room has been renovated. When the ship reopens, you can actually stay there. In, in people B340. want to stay there. <laughs> crew every year who start with us who are new who end up either leaving early refusing to work in certain areas of the ship um, I think a lot of people don't believe all of the hype until they're in it <laughs> and then they get a dose I'll never forget the first time Wally called me during show to let me know that one of the actors had quit because they were terrified and didn't didn't like their position they were terrified so they had had a paranormal experience and I said wait a minute they took a job at a, at a haunted event on a haunted ship and now they're scared because of the taunting I think the scariest time I had we were doing um, a photo shoot down in the pool which is one of the most alive paranormal areas and you guys have me like backing up backing up into those quarters which are the old dressing rooms where people have seen seen apparitions and I did feel very cold there and um, it was very very creepy being actually physically being in the pool was, was quite creepy okay um, over the years Dark Harbor has become uh, known for its recognizable characters and how have you been able to grow these characters to have such a strong following well great I, I, talent but <laughs> it's a great talent yeah, I think it really is. I mean, I think the talent that we have is amazing. Um, every
everybody is so committed to the work that they do. And, you know, we talked earlier about the trust that we have amongst ourselves. And I have to have that with the people that work with me that, you know, I can't possibly be in every position, in every maze, on every square foot of the footprint, no matter how hard I work, and neither can my staff that works with me. So it's really important that the people that work with us know what the expectations are and know what the purpose is of the position they're doing to bring our guests a good time. And it can be challenging, you know, because oftentimes our guests can be a little bit unruly, uh, particularly after they've went and uh, visited one of those well-stocked bars. Uh -huh. But everybody really does a great job and really rises to the occasion, particularly um, our main characters and, and our maze monsters and everybody really. Um, these are a few of the other uh, main characters that we brought in in subsequent years. Burdetta Jackson, our incredible voodoo priestess that brought fire. Um, the Iron Master, who came from that um, trip to Scotland that Stephen Charity took. And Chef, who's also based on an actual character from the ship, who, he was a chef, correct me if I'm wrong, whose crew basically got tired of him and pushed him in the oven. And he got burned over 90% of his body. Fun times. I this think, is, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I think uh, just something important to know too, the reason that um, you know, characters are able to develop and the reason that the talent um, has such a devotion to the event is really um, because they have that trust with David. David is such a, um, uh, an advocate for all of the talent, all of the actors making sure that they have what they need to do what they do, uh, making sure that, you know, everyone, um, you know, that Cherry and I especially have a, an understanding of exactly what they need and what they're facing and uh, really bringing, you know, if there is a plight, bringing that uh, to life with us so that we can do whatever we need to do to address it because sometimes people do get unruly and sometimes, you know, positions aren't more difficult, you know, in reality than what we've imagined and David is, fantastic at advocating on behalf of the talent and they trust him because of that. I think that's a, a huge reason why, um, you know, talent stays for the long term and they grow year over year. And I think also, you know, coming from the production side, um, when we're looking at these you know, large budgets and doling out monies to di different departments and sections, um, one of the first departments we sit down with is talent because you know, David usually comes in with a great long list of requirements and demands. And, um, and, and we do feel like it's very important to hit as many as we can, you know, as many as possible. And I think that um, to start talent first is, is a really important thing in our process. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about turning our characters iconic, um, while it's the talent, it's the costume, it's the makeup, it's the direction, it's, you know, it's also a team that we rarely discuss, which is great marketing, you know, good social stories, um, driving a lot of our, you know, if you come to our event, you have the option of buying into the story as much or as little as you want to. You know, we want to design and create, you know, your scare experience um, for the nuance follower who's been with us for a decade. Um, all the way to the person who's arriving for the first time and just wants to be frightened, or maybe not frightened at all, and just wants to go on a little spooky pub crawl with us. Um, with that comes story that we have to drive in more places than just in the event footprint. So I think it's really cool also to be able to drag that out through social media and, and other media. So we've got a marketing, a, a small but mighty marketing team that works around the clock with us as well. Yeah, I want to back up a couple of slides because there was this great story that happened um, in like the fourth or fifth year, I think. And uh, the young woman on the bottom in the middle, uh, Danielle Kaufman, yeah, played this incredible, just ferocious character. She, she would like go backstage and she'd make herself a bowl of oatmeal and stuff it in her mouth and just be vomiting all over everybody throughout the event. She was a really, really special character. and. Like in 2014 or 2015, um, this Japanese man from Japan um, walked up to me with, and somebody pointed him over to me, and he walked over to me, and he was showing me his phone. He, he couldn't speak, speak very good English, but he was showing me a picture of Danielle. He wanted to see her, and I had to tell him that she, she wasn't working the event that year, 
and he was so crestfallen <laughs> that it, it, it really made me understand, speaking of marketing and, and the work that the people do, like how much these characters belong not just to us and, and, and the people who play them, but our audience as well. Um, just wanted to go through a couple of other photos here of like our amazing stage performers. Um, the fire performers are just amazing. Um, our so sliders David, are David, incredible. How, how many of the yay? One of the things I love about the sliders too is for years I was talking to the guys about, you know, we need a woman, we need a woman, we need to bring a woman onto the team. And we finally found somebody who, who wanted to do it and she was amazing. She was with us for a year or two. But then in the last couple of years that we ran the event, we, we had multiple women on the show and they were ferocious and great and so great. We love the diversity of our cast. How many of the stories are written and how many are created by the actors um, just who, who are out on the street or in the mazes? I think that we, you know, in the early days, as you all remember, you know, we did a stage show for one or two years for those main characters, um, and we really had origin stories with them that, you know, the actors took and play with, and one of the other things that happens is in trying to make something new every year is we oftentimes change up, you know, the mazes. You know, there was a year where um, Graceful Gale was in Submerged, you know, and then she went over to Soulmate, and then Soulmate went away, and you know, Hatch, half Hatch Henry has bounced around a couple of bases. So we've allowed their stories to evolve a little bit, and also, again, trust-wise, allowing the actors to perform them. Um, I, I've got one coming up in a couple of pages that I want to talk to you about a little bit. Um, but the, the, we extend that through to each of the positions in the maze as well, to understand what the purpose is of the character at that scare position, and what they're trying to do, and what their story is within it and we communicate that to the cast as best we can. But, and I don't know how this is at other mazes, but every night my wonderful little bastards create more work with me because there will be a lot of absences every night. And I might have, you know, a quarter to a third of the cast that I have to bring in backups to fill different positions every night, which is super duper fun for them. But part of the gig is that we also have to get them to understand what the purpose is tonight in this maze, in this position, that might be different from where they were at a previous night. So there's a lot of homework that goes into not just getting an event open at the end of September, but each and every night making sure that we're putting on a great show for the people that are coming that night, because they don't really care what it was night one. They want to know what it's like night 15. And our work continues every night. And then you would have the all-stars who could just, you know, sandwich themselves into a maze every night and just sort of be like they were there from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I always, when I cast, I try to figure out like, who are my like 20 to 30 most diverse, versatile people? And I don't assign them to a position. I assign them to the all-star role, which is like every night you're gonna play something different. And sometimes they're on the street, sometimes they're in a maze position, and unfailingly, they just throw themselves into every position that they're, that they're in. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any one of our actors has a specific script. I don't think any one actor is in a position where they're saying the same thing over and over again five more times a night. It's, here's your position, here's the essence of what you're doing, uh, here are the parameters that you're allowed to, to scare with it. Um, make Bring it, it to life. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that's what creates an organic scare. You know, it's, um, we do our best to remain far away from the formulaic. Um, it's just not our shtick. Um, you know, it's like we want to be able to have you go through a maze multiple times a night or multiple times a season and feel like it's a completely different maze every time you visit it. One of the things, you know, when I joined in the first year, of like, uh, what's a Halloween? What am I going to do? Tell them to say boo. Like, I didn't, I had no real idea of like what the job was until I started doing it. And what I realized early on that what Dark Harbor really was, was this massive canvas to do immersive theater in. And the piece that you can't teach anybody, you just have to trust them to live, is what is that immersive relationship between them and each guest that comes through. Because if you're in a maze, you've got a different, you know, a different show opening every 20 or 30 seconds, you know, and you have to find a way to bring that to life for, for, for all the different people that come through. So just to, I'm sorry, to, just to back up a minute for, for our aspiring haunters and, and our seasoned haunters, tell us a little bit about the auditions and what you're really looking for. The auditions? Well, 
more than anything, is you're looking for somebody who has it within them to be a kid again, to let go, to get out of their own way, to not be inhibited, um, and to bring something truly to life. We, we had this one wonderful performer a couple years ago, uh, uh, um, uh, Guru, who came in who had never worked with uh, and this fucking guy. Uh, he did this like turkey character all over the room. I was horrified. I wanted to leave and just cast him and find a cloning machine so I could just have another hundred of, like him. But he really brought his stuff to the thing. And then all it really was was, you know, allow him to have the space to do his thing uh, and make sure that he also knew that there was a boundary, you know, and as long as you played within that boundary, you were going to be good. And I think most of my monsters can attest to the fact that nobody really ever gets on my bad side unless they step over that very finely defined line, you know, that they know they shouldn't cross over. Otherwise, I'm there to support everybody. I, I, I picked these four characters here because these are for you know wonderful actors who came up with these incredibly iconic characters that our audiences love that had nothing to do with me other than casting them and getting out of their way and costumes way and makeups way and and let them um, play and make incredible um, creations. This is some of our circus team over the year. Brilliant, brilliant. Different great iconic characters from Dark Harbor that you guys I'm sure all remember. Dead Rye is one of my favorite mazes of all time. So alive, and the, those guys created this energy at the end of the maze, and like it was worth the price of admission for not only the people going through the maze, but people would hang around at the end just to see all these people get terrified as they exit the maze. I loved it. And uh, again, those stage performers that we started out with, um, and I think the first couple of years we started, we had like a magician and a sideshow performer. And when Steve and Charity really came into their own, you know, Charity in particular, like, really was, like, pushing me to, like, let's find more entertainment and let's get the entertainment not just on the stages but off the stages. And once that happened and we allocated the budget to really, you know, grow that program, you know, we got into aerial, we got into clowning, we got into marionettes and musicians and found performers who had been with us as monsters for years that ended up being terrific at, uh, at these different things. Um, so it just really helped to grow the event and make it that party atmosphere. Yeah, and I think a lot of it too is, I mean, just from years of being a guest at a Halloween haunt, as you guys know, it, you spend the majority of your time in a queue line. So how can we fix that? Or how can we entertain you well in the queue line? And that became, you know, that's the answer we were striving for for a, a good couple of years at the beginning, from 12 to, I'd say, 15. We were, we were really looking and pushing the envelope. At one point, we had bars in every queue. We had um, stages in every queue, mini stages. Um, and, and then we kind of fell back and kind of pick, picked things in the middle, where we now have a sprinkle of stages everywhere, lots of bars, even immersed within the, in the mazes themselves. Because once you spend two hours in line, you might want to stay in that world immersed for more than the couple minutes you get to when you're just, you know, trailing through the maze itself. Um, and we found that there was, you know, a lot of appetite for that as well to say, I want to stay in Dead Rise longer. I want to stay, you know, in Lullaby and and feel immersed in that longer. And so we kind of dove into that kind of entertainment as well. But I think that just kind of goes back to what we were saying, which also gives you opportunity to hobnob and rub elbows with some of our main characters inside those, those bars and experiences. Um, but I think that just goes back to what we talked about earlier of just trying to make sure that every year we're pushing the envelope, doing something you know, different and a little more unique. Um, and I, I think that's what drives us. And for me, getting to the, the, the getting to live in a character for six years, just what a what a joy that was, and what a luxury, because you really get to know that character, and you're always thinking of new things, and it just takes on such a new life. But also, just the relationships that you create with the other characters grew so much. And back to some of the little just pop-up stage shows, those a lot of those just came about organically. I, often, I would be walking the street, and I'd start with the voodoo team or join the fire show or well the ringmaster could join any show <laughs> um, but just to see all those little um, 
like little lotsies, you know, the little Italian little bits pop up everywhere. It was just such a joy. Twirly and, and Mud and all these great characters that took on lives of their own. And nothing made me happier to see all of those incredible things happening that I had absolutely nothing to do with, you know, but that you guys knew you had the license to do it and that you were making the stuff happen without being told to. We felt trust and we felt comfort, comfort and we felt in a very safe space in which to create and that was important too. Even though it was a scary space, it was safe. The, um, the bottom left picture is one of my favorites for a couple of reasons. One, I was about 50 pounds lighter then, but I'm working on my way back and it's gonna happen. This is my year. Uh, but also, We've all gained, gained the COVID-19. Yeah, I'm 17 pounds down in the last month and I've cut my blood sugar by a third. So that's right. Get back to fighting shape. Uh, but the person that's in that picture with me is my beloved friend Peggy McGee, who I actually went to college with. And Peggy and I know each other since we're 18 years old. I know um, it's hard to believe because he looks so much older than I. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when we have... You know, it's so funny, this thing just wants to keep going forward, and I say no. Um, Peggy created um, the Ringmaster character um, and really brought it to life in ways that none of us could have possibly imagined that character would be. Um, and, you know, she over the years had a couple of, you know, understudies that had to be ready to go on because sometimes people have to miss a show and stuff like that. Um, but. It wasn't until a couple of years in that we had another performer who started playing the ringmaster um, that she and Peggy became very close friends with. And when Peggy got to a point where it's like, yeah, I want to do it, but I don't necessarily want to do the entire season, um, that the two of them became to share the role, you know. And the thing that was interesting is, I think people's inclinations those early years was, oh, why can't the people who are playing the ringmaster when Peggy's not here be more like Peggy? And the reality is, nobody could be like Peggy. Um, Peggy's... As the ringmaster would say, you might as well stop applauding, for it will never be enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality is, only Peggy can play that character the way Peggy played it, because that was her interpretation, and, and run at it. And the other gentleman who played the character, Andrew Diego here, um, <laughs> who's just a wonderful performer, had much more of a sort of, uh, like a darker, more uh, cabaret, um, master of ceremonies take on the character that was his, you know? And so you just had to trust that and let the actors be the best version of the character that they could be when they were playing. One thing I will say, with all the main characters, you know, every year we sit down as a, as a team, a collaborative group, and we go, okay, where is this character going this year? What are we, you know, what's, how is the story evolving? Uh, what are we doing? The remaster is the one character that we never sit down and talk about where the story is going because we have we like where's where's the remaster going this year? Like, we don't know. Stay uh, tuned. Very organic. Yeah. Like, right. Um, I have one last slide. I just want to go to really quickly because all of these great photo photographers have over the years um, done incredible work um, at Dark Harbor capturing our event and. Uh, developing those assets that we're able to look at you. So, uh, Griff Shavaria and Albert Lamb and Jonathan Lewis, Grant Palmer and Michael Wada, thank you very much for letting me sit down. So, let's move into I Know For Me. I didn't really realize the whole character, I was thrilled when I got it, um, but I didn't really realize the whole character until I had the costume on and the makeup. And I especially didn't find the voice until I saw the makeup sketch with her, her ravaged throat. Because I, when I started working on her, I was way up here and very presentational. And then when I saw that gash, I thought, oh, she's got severed vocal cords. So it brought the voice down lower and into my belly more. And I think that helped me sustain the character. And I, I rarely had vocal trouble during the run, which many people did, because um, I was coming from a lower place, which was comfortable. Um, let's talk about some of the, the character development and through costuming, through makeup, what that process is like. Charity, you want to field that one? Sure. Um, you know, first of all, we have a costume and makeup to two separate teams, and they're incredible. I feel like we can go to them with our crazy ideas 
and they whip out magic. Um, you know, our our makeup team consists of anywhere between 25 and 30 um, makeup artists every season, and they're a machine. But even before we get to the machine, which every night I marvel at how we get that many people through makeup and onto the stage in such a short period of time, especially because we don't use masks for the most part. Um, almost all of it is airbrushed. Almost all of it is you know, hand-done prosthetics, often molded and casted by Jeff and his team um, personally. So they just do incredible work. Um, and then the same thing with costume. We get to sit down with Katie and Katie will say, no, Charity, no, no, it will not cost that. <laughs> Um, but she can really take a character um, and whatever we put down on paper, whatever our drawing is of the character, and she makes it not only come to life, she makes it affordable, she makes it something she can replicate a million times, um, and she makes it comfortable enough for our actor to be able to bring it to life comfortably every night as well. And she too, not just our team has to get the backups or the all-stars ready to go, but her department has to take, you know, whatever we throw at her. And I'm usually pretty good at it, but there's usually like at least a couple of times a season, she'll just walk out with the character and the put eye, the person I've cast at night, you know, who's like two sizes too small or too big for the costume and just look at me, it's like, what are you doing? You kill me, you know? <laughs> Um, and, and the makeup team is like every night they don't know what's coming at them, you know. There's a there's established relations with a few characters and a few artists, but for the most part it's like, you know, they're in a line and I'm pointing them to a different artist and sometimes the artists are talking to me about, you know, I don't want to do another Scary Mary for a couple of hours, you know, can I get somebody else or something like that, you know. And um, it really helps them as artists to grow as well. And every character leaving the room every night is just truly a work of art. Yeah. So I'm just dazzled by it. I think our average is 12 minutes per That's character. Correct. Average of 12 minutes per character, which is considering it's, you know, it's all airbrushing is phenomenal. Sometimes they can get done even faster than that, like when you have like high-speed video that can walk people through it. Do you guys have a video back there that you can show about sort of our, our makeup process? That's our captain. Being worked on by Renee. for you. At my co to um, you've worked on a lot of themed experiences that deal directly with big international, uh, intellectual properties, big IPs. Um, how does the creative process change when you're developing those kind of attractions? And uh, how does that change versus, you know, an IP versus an original story? Mm -hmm. What What's very different with what we do is we're dealing with original content. So we really, you know, the approval process is us looking at each other saying, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Um, <laughs> When you're doing an IP that is already established, that's already branded, characters that already belong to the audience, you have to be, as we say, on IP, on brand. Um, so it's very, very important that you, in the casting process, um, are casting people who are going to look very, very similar to those characters. Um, sometimes they're, for a Halloween haunt, we, we did a Halloween haunt a couple of years ago um, with another company that, that there were a lot of on IP characters. And, you know, one of the producers for that, like, really wanted people to look exactly like the people at the movie. 
and I was like, we're in Hollywood, and this is a seasonal event, and you're paying $14 an hour, you're just not going to get that every single night, so you're going to need to trust me and let me come close to that. Um, and then for characters that really had to, um, some of the characters were masked in, in a heavy prosthetic so that no matter who was there, they would look very, very similar to it. But just as we have established trust with ourselves, you have to establish trust with the IP holder and let them know that you understand that you're being given the privilege of working with their IP and that you're going to be a trustworthy guardian of that and that you're going to be open to whatever input they have and making the change they need to do. I'm working on a project right now that we had a lock skip Friday night and then we had a work session and I wrote all day yesterday to make the changes that will hopefully get us back to having a lock script. Um, but that's the nature of the business. That's the showbiz, David. <laughs> there it is. Um, okay, uh, once the stories are developed and the mazes have to be fabricated and then brought to reality, what are some of the challenges you face when producing a Halloween attraction, especially on our queen, the historic vessel, and with all of her isms and <laughs> things? How about yes. Steve, you want to take that? She is persnickety, the, the yes. queen. Yes. Um, so we work really closely with the historic resources advisor, um, at the ship to make sure that everything that we're doing is approved and within the parameters that we've been given. Um, it's, you know, th three mazes on the ship in historic areas that were for sure never built with the intention of having thousands of guests uh, walk through them is challenging. Um, on top of that, because of the historic nature, we can't touch or change any thing that is attached to the ship. Um, so even, you know, the walls that you see are false walls that we've built for the most part in front of um, the actual walls. If there's anything that we need to paint or we need to change, um, that's something that we've brought in. Um, and so every, literally every change that we make, um, we have to get, get sign off uh, from the Historic Resources Advisor, make sure that it's not changing um, any uh, anything with ingress or egress, making sure that the, the fire sprinklers are still in the correct places to be able to get proper coverage and if we're, we're building false walls. Um, so there, there's a lot that goes into it to make sure that we're, you know, we're checking all of the boxes and, and most importantly, um, preserving, you know, doing our part to preserve the ship and making sure that when we, um, when we pack up at the end of the season that we're leaving her in at least as good a shape as we found her when we started building, you know, in, in March. We, we really only have, in a typical year, three or four months off, um, but but we try to leave her in as good a shape or, or better shape than uh, when we left in, in November. And, you know, uh, we have, we've alluded to before the, the incredible designers that have worked on the show over the years, J.J. Wickham and John Cook and John Asper and um, have always designed in such a way to bring the ship to life and also to know and have respect for the ship and what can be done. And Adam Conger and Stephen Taylor and David Boykins and all those guys who work just so tirelessly for months and are, are good stewards of the ship as well. The, the ship is in good hands with our team. Yeah, I think one thing um, for anyone who has ever worked on the Queen, and I know there are some of you in the audience, and we can all attest to it up here, once you have worked at the Queen, despite her quirks and despite any frustrations, um, I think you almost immediately develop a love for the ship. Um, yes, I love the old floozy. Yes, I think we all do. And so our, our entire team is, you know, dedicated. I, I don't think we could, um, I don't think we could do it unless everybody was on the same page and, and everybody uh, really respected the, the environment and what we need to do. Well, one team, one dream. Yeah, and I think that's part of what we, you know, what we're tasked to do is to tell her story in a more meaningful way to introduce the asset, the ship herself, to a new generation year after year. Um, I think that's part of the reason that we're there, you know. Um, she has such a rich old history and we're not too far off from anyone who boarded that ship soon will have, have no, will no longer be here to tell those stories. So I think we feel an obligation to carry on her story um, and also keep her at the forefront of everyone's minds because there there is some really rich history there. The, the, the history we play with as well as, um, you know, the historic 
um, true value of, of the ship herself. And all of our competitors, you know, and uh, friendly competitors out there have great teams that work on their events and they have great casts and they have people, they have wonderful mazes, they have all these things that they do great in different ways. But the one thing that we have that's just so important for us is we always have that beautiful ship as our backdrop, you know, that really yeah. sets the tone and place making that we're so privileged to, 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 to be able to work with. Yeah. Awesome. So if you see a petition to save the Queen, please sign it. <laughs> well, I think we have a few more minutes. Would you uh, be willing to field some questions yeah, absolutely. from our fans? Absolutely. Can we turn the house lines up a little bit and take a couple of questions? I think there's a mic.